Greetings and welcome. We are in Junior English, and we now turn to a conversation with the great Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Now, I'm with you in your hymnals on 634, 635 to begin with. We want to make a couple of quick observations about Dunbar starting with the biography information on 635. Go there with me now. 635, you ought to be looking at the biographic information. Go ahead and record the dates of 1872 to 1906. He dies tragically young. Uh, of tuberculosis, as the, uh, this uh, biography will explain it on 635. I want to just read, though, the first opening lines of this biography. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was born, uh, was the first African American author to attain national recognition and support himself entirely from his writing. So you want to write that down. Dunbar is the first African American black writer who celebrates and is celebrated. And he lives his life as a writer. Okay, so in other words, he's able to make enough money so that he can live as a writer. All right, that's a significant moment for us to find that we actually have a, um, a, a, a person of color who can do that. Notice he was the son of former slaves, born in Dayton, Ohio, encouraged by his mom to begin writing at an early age. The only African-American student in his high school class, Dunbar served as president of the Literary Society, class poet, and editor of the school newspaper. In other words, from the very youngest of ages, we want to write this down about Dunbar, he was a man who wanted to be a poet. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Dunbar will work with two different styles of poetry. We're going, to study, we're going to study two of his offerings. One of those is highly elaborate, formal verse. And so I'm with you on page 634 really quickly under literary analysis at 2B. Formal verse. Let's jot down what that means. What that means is Dunbar is going to try to write poetry that is a part of the classical poetic tradition, beginning with the great Italian writer Petrarch down through the, Shakes, uh, the Shakespearean sonnets of the Elizabethan era. I want to point out that of the first of the two offerings, we're going to be looking at two titles of his. The first one will be Douglas, and the second is We Wear the Mask. Uh, in his text, Douglas, I want to point out that it is a Petrarchian sonnet. I'm with you on 634. Write down Petrarchian, of or related to the Italian poet Petrarch. Right? And also notice that there will be several things we want to point out about this poem. First of all, because it's a sonnet, we write it down right away. It's 14 lines, so write that down. That's the first thing. It's 14 lines, okay? Secondly, you're going to have a certain kind of rhyme scheme or pattern of rhyming words. Do you see it? Notice the opening four lines. Ah, uh, Douglas, we have fallen on evil days, such days as thou, not even thou didst know, when thee the eyes of that heart long ago saw silent, uh, salient at the cross of devious ways. Now, notice you've got A, B, B, A. Do you see it? A, B, B, A. So a Petrarchian sonnet is going to have a certain kind of rhyme scheme that we want to pay attention to, okay? Um, we also should point out separation uh, into one stand of eight lines, one stand of six lines. So we should point that one out as well. We'll study this a bit more in detail as we come to the actual text, Douglas. I'm with you now on 637. Let's look at it together. The background information, please read it with me now. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was among the first generation to have an ongoing contact with former African American slaves. As a child, Dunbar heard stories from his father who had escaped captivity and fought during the Civil War. In his poems, Dunbar expresses the pain of racial injustice and the struggles of African Americans to achieve equality. In Douglas, the text we're about to study, he calls upon the memory of Frederick Douglas, of course we've studied him already, given lectures on him 1817 to 1895, the great African American abolitionist. So we are now going to turn to Paul Ernst Dunbar's Douglas, and we want to study this as in two things. You want to write this down as we get ready to go. Two things we're going to look at this poem as. First of all, we're going to look at it in terms of form. Second, in terms of content. I'll say these again so you can write it down at 2B. First, we're going to look at it in terms of form. In other words, this is a sonnet, a very formal kind of form. Okay. Then secondly, we will look at it in terms of content. This is what we will often refer to as a tribute poem. Write that down at 2B. A tribute poem where Paul Ernst Dunbar is going to pay tribute or honor to a great American, of course, in this case, Frederick Douglass. There's a picture, by the way, of Frederick Douglass on 
uh, 636, the great emancipate uh, 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 slave who has escaped slave, who ultimately will write those two biographies. I've given uh, lectures elsewhere on that. Let's look at the poem itself. Ah, Douglas, we have fallen on evil days, such days as thou, not even thou didst know, when thee, the eyes of that harsh long ago saw salient at the cross of devious ways, and all the country heard thee with amaze. Not ended then, the passionate ebb and flow, the awful tide that battled to and fro. We ride amid a tempest of dispraise. Now, when the ways of swift dissension swarm, and honor the strong pilot lieth stark, O oh, for thy voice, high sounding o'er the storm, for thy strong arm to guide the shivering bark, the blast defying power of thy form to give us comfort through the lonely dark. Let's go ahead now and turn. I said we would be working at two levels here. The first is form and the second is content. Let's work form, shall we, really quickly. Again, so I call a Petrarchan sonnet. Let's go to work with it. First of all, notice how the poem is divided into two parts. You'll want to write this down. Divided into two parts. Do you see it? So notice that we will work up through um, uh, line eight, right? And then we'll break, and then we will have the following six lines to finish with our 14 lines. Okay? Notice that the poem is divided up into two observations spoken to Douglas. Note, Douglas already dead. So he is speaking to a man now who is no longer alive. And he says to that man, we need you here. We need you in this time. Okay. I should point out at 3A that we have a similar kind of poem, very, uh, very important poem, written by uh, w w William Wordsworth, the great English poet, who wrote a very similar poem to Milton saying to John Milton, we need you here, we need, we, we, need your, uh, we need your help. Let's take a look at what he says. He says, first of all, in the first, uh, we'll call it stanza, the first grouping of eight lines, he says three important things. Let's write it down. One, he says to Douglas, we have fallen on evil days. Who is the we that he's talking about? You could say it's we Americans. You could say it's we African Americans, black Americans. You could say it's we humans living in a time when things are not going very well. Look what he says. Such days even that you could not have imagined when the, the eyes of that harsh long ago saw salient at the cross of devious ways. The second thing we would say in this part is that Dunbar recognized that Douglas was somewhat of a prophet. I would write that down. That Frederick Douglass was somewhat of a prophet. He saw that rough days were coming after the American Civil War. What rough days? All the country heard thee with amaze back in the time. Not ended then. The passion and ebb and flow, the awful tide that battled to and fro, we ride amid a tempest of dispraise. Now, let's go ahead and write this down because this is a significant moment for us here. He will point out that things after the Emancipation Proclamation, things got worse, not better. I would write that down. Things were more challenging once slaves were emancipated in another lecture I've already given. We talk about the challenges of these poets as they find their ways into the cities. They are ill-prepared, these emancipated slaves, for the life that they have to live. And here Dunbar will point out the problem is dispraise. Stark dispraise. In other words, many African Americans are blamed for the American Civil War. I would write that down. It is significant. Many whites blame blacks who follow, like Dunbar, the son of slaves. He himself wasn't even alive during the time of the American Civil War. Many whites blame blacks for the American Civil War and the pain that follows the American Civil War. This dispraise is a challenge Dunbar will write about. Now, now, second stanza, now, when the waves of swift 
dissension swarm. Are we united after the American Civil War? Are we united after the Emancipation Proclamation? Dunbar says, I don't think so. Racial divide still powerful. Now, when the waves of swift dissension swarm and honor, notice it's capitalized, the strong pilot lieth stark. There is no, there is no honor left anymore. Oh, for thy voice, high sounding o'er the storm. For thy strong arm to guide the shivering bark. Bark here means ship. You'll want to write it down. In other words, his comment is the United States is like a ship that is sailing in a storm. Let's point out at 3A, this is not a new metaphor. Dunbar is, is playing a game here. He is making an allusion or literary uh, uh, reference to Walt Whitman's O Captain, My Captain. After the killing of Lincoln, the assassination of Lincoln, Whitman will say America is like a ship that's been out on the sea in the tempest, in the storm. You have a very similar kind of dynamic in play here as well. Notice, for thy strong arm to guide the shivering bark, the blast defying power of thy form to give us comfort through the lonely dark. All right, let's jump now to 2A really quickly as we work through messages, themes of this poem. Let's say a couple at least. Dunbar is sad for the loss of Frederick Douglass's voice. Time has not made things better, but more challenging. The strong voice of Frederick Douglass is gone, and Dunbar will say, we need your help. We do not have this kind of voice, this strong arm, Second message, notice, honor is gone. Honor is gone. Now this is demanding because so many Americans died in the American Civil War. Remember, we made the observation in the Gettysburg Address lecture, 10 warlords in three days died. Lots of Americans die. Lincoln himself dies. The American Civil War is fought so that African-American slave, black slaves could be free and ultimately considered Americans. But, Dunbar will point out, things are not going very well for us at all. We need you here, a tribute poem. Of course, it, it, to be very simple, this is a Petrarchian sonnet. Notice the breakdown, right? Okay, right. Let's point out now at 3A, observations. Let's talk about related texts. What is for you the, po the film... The, the TV show that celebrates a hero for you that you like as your number one example of that kind of text. What is for you your favorite, tr your favorite tribute text? Do you have a favorite tribute text? A true life person, somebody who actually lived, who is given some kind of honor or respect tribute. Okay. Let's think as well about the titles that for you are going to be the best examples of celebration of another person. Celebration of a person who is maybe missed. Right? And let's jump now to 3B. What is for you the person that you think could help America the most right now? If there's one person who you could bring back from history, one person who you could bring back that could help the problems of America. Who would that person be? Write that name down. If there's one person that you would like to bring back to help the problems of the world, who would that person be for you? Is there one person who comes to mind for you? And finally, a 3B question. Who is the one person in your life personally who is now gone, who you would like to bring back? One person who you'd like to bring back. Or one person you'd like to meet who is now missing. In your own personal life, somebody who you would like to meet, somebody who you would like to have come back and visit, who would make things better. Is there a person in your life who maybe you call on to say when things are going bad, if I only had this person, I think things would be better for me. Is there that person in your life? Do you have somebody that you could say, I wish you were here. I wish you were part of this. Let's turn now to 638 and the second of the two offerings by Dunbar. We wear the mask. This is maybe 
um, the most popular of his poems. And it raises some very interesting questions. Let's take a look at it. Notice this one is not a sonnet. This one, notice a poem of 15 lines instead. We wear the mask. Read it with me. I'm on 638. We wear the mask. I hope that you're I hope that you're reading with me. Don't just listen to me read this. Read along. Read the words. I'm again with you on 638. Read the words with me. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks, shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be otherwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but... O oh, great Christ, our cries to Thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. I want to point out a couple of important observations really quickly about this poem. Jot down in your notes, what is the significant difference between the two refrains of we wear the mask. Notice the first time the, the phrase gets used. Are you looking at it with me? I hope you are. Notice the first time the, the phrase gets used, we wear the mask. And then look at the last time, the last line of the poem. What is different? Because the words are exactly the same. Do you see that? The words are the same. What is different? Of course, that exclamation point matters at the end of this poem. Let's write it down in 2B. That exclamation point is going to send a powerful message, we might say. Now let's work at level one really quickly. First of all, we're going to point out this is a poem of three stanzas, isn't it? Right? This is a poem that ostensibly says what at level one. It's a dumb poem, we might say, about what? Level one, summary. It is a poem that says, even though we're really sad, we wear a mask to make us look happy so that nobody can know how we really feel. Simple poem. Simple sentiment. Let's go to 2A really quickly though. Because we have a question. Who is the we? Who is the we? Who is Paul Lawrence Dunbar talking for? Notice, this poem is not, look at it with me, I wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides my cheeks and shades my eyes. No, 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 no. That is not this poem. This poem is not I wear a mask, but rather we wear a mask that hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. So in other words, he says, we get up in the morning and before we see anybody, we put a mask on our face so that nobody can see our eyes. They're crying. And nobody can see our cheeks. The tears coming down. Is he speaking literally? No. No. He's not saying that there's a group of people who have taken to wearing masks. On. No, 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 no. We're talking in metaphor here. We're talking in metaphor about what and who is the we that wears this mask? There are two renderings of this poem. One, one obviously, is that Paul Lawrence Dunbar is writing as a black American, as an African American. He is making the observation that people of color have to wear a mask. They cannot let people know how they really feel about how terrible things have gone. So that he uses the refrain twice, we wear the mask. And the second time, he uses the exclamation point. There is a second rending of this, rendering of this poem, though, at 2A. And it can say, you know, people read this poem and continue to read this poem as an attempt to try to hide the true you. Who you really are. What you really think. Do you have a sense that we're all in high school that you're, there are people on the, in the halls that you meet Hey, how's it going? And they say, oh, it's great. Everything is great. Do you have a sense 
They're lying. They're lying. And behind that, oh, it's great. Everything is great. I'm having a great day. Everything's awesome, dude. It's all right behind that. Yeah, no. And in fact, if you were to say to them, really, how are you doing? They would say to you, yeah, nothing at all. This poem, now working at 2A, this poem then suggests that we are a people that seem to want to hide our weakness, hide our pain. Don't anybody see. We wear a mask. Notice it isn't a mask, though. Notice it is the mask. It's the mask of laughter. See the first line? Grinning. Smiling. Yay! Everything is great. Yay! Now, of course, if you're going to read this poem, as Paul Lawrence Dunbar probably meant you to read the poem, as standing or representing a group of people who have to pretend like everything is okay and smiling when in fact everything is not okay. There's a lot of sadness, there's a lot of pain associated for Lawrence Dunbar and the rest of African American readers of this poem during his time. This poem can be a powerful message to white readers of, of Dunbar's day. Is it possible that people look really happy on the outside, but they are not happy at all on the inside because they still feel they are not treated equal. They are not, they're, they're biased against, they're, there's racism, and they're not treated fair. Of course, at 2B, this is a poem notice of three stanzas. Word choice is powerful here, but the thing I would write down in 2B here is obviously the metaphor. The metaphor of the mask. And I've had junior readers of this poem that say, I think I understand what he's getting at, because some of the people